Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> oh, you guys are funny. Always the second time. What is it? What is it that keeps you Christian? What is it that you turn back to? What is it that you fall back to? What is it that you continually go back to to remind you of who God is? For me, it's this message. If it wasn't for the message that I'm going to share with you this afternoon, I'm more than certain that I would not be a Christian today. More than certain that I would not be a Christian today. And so if this message can in any way, even in the slightest way, help you the way that it's helped me, So many times, so many times I've come this close, and every time, every time Jesus just comes up trumps. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we have sinned against you and against heaven. And we are not worthy to be called your daughters or your sons. But Father, your son, Jesus Christ, will forever be worthy to be called our Savior. And so we ask, Lord, we plead that it is he and not me that speaks to us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And if you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, please turn to the book of Matthew chapter 6. The book of Matthew chapter 6. I find that just after Matthew chapter 5. Coincidentally, before chapter 7. So Matthew chapter 6, when you're there, say amen. Jesus is teaching his disciples about prayer. Now let me ask you a question from the get-go. Were the disciples prior to meeting Jesus, were they religious people, yes or no? Do you think that perhaps they went to religious schools, yes or no? That they had rabbis of their own, in fact... Some little inside information is that they wanted to be rabbis themselves, but they just didn't make the cut. They weren't good enough. They weren't smart enough. They weren't intelligent enough. They couldn't really grasp the Hebrew. Are you with me? But one can imagine that these disciples already had a prayer life. Would you agree? But yet for some reason, they come to Jesus and they ask Jesus, teach us how to pray. Now, if you're going to ask someone to teach you to do something that you're already doing, you're recognizing in that person that there's some sort of connection, that there's some sort of response, that there's some sort of relationship when it comes to prayer that you do not yet have. And so they come to Jesus, Matthew chapter 6. And let's read from verse 5. Jesus speaking, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter where? Enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which is in secret shall reward thee openly. And then he says this, but when ye pray, use not what? Vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their what? Don't miss this point. This is the main point already. People, some people believe, maybe you believe this, I believe this, that the reason that God hears my prayers is because I'm speaking them. Okay, you're not with me yet. He says... They think that they shall be heard because of how much they're saying. They think that what's taking their prayers to heaven is the fact that they're addressing God by the right titles. That they're going by, you know, the right order. And that they're doing this much. Jesus says, that's not how your prayers get heard. Then he says this. Be you not therefore like them. For your father know what things you have need of, when? Before you ask. After this manner, therefore, pray thee, our father. 
Jesus is teaching for the first time about prayer, at least that we have recorded. And you can imagine that the first thing that Christ says about this topic is going to be the most important thing. And so in order to break down their prejudices and destroy all their forms, he comes to them and says, let me teach you how to pray. Let's start together. Our Father. Why is this the first thing that he wants to bring to their attention? Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Psalms. Chapter 103, let's just lay this foundation real quick. Psalms 103, and I'll read verse 13. Psalms 103, 1, 3. Psalms 103, verse 13 says this. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pities who? Like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those that fear him. Christ is trying to teach us something about the character of the Father when it comes to prayer. He's trying to teach us that the Lord pities his children. That the Lord looks down and earnestly desires and longs to not just hear the cries of his children, but to answer them as any father would with his children. How many of you here this afternoon are parents? Let me see your hand. If you're a youth or if you're not a youth, let me see your hand nice and high because I'm going to ask you guys a question and I'm going to require that you verbally respond. How many of you can verbally respond? And it needs to be allowed so we can pick up the response. Let me ask you a question. You've acknowledged, yes, I have a child or maybe more than one. Let's say that child gets to 16 years old. We spoke about the prodigal son yesterday morning. Let's say that that child gets to 16 years old and the child decides that they're finished. They're done with home. They're finished living under your rulership. They're finished living with your rules. And they decide they're going to pack it all in, get their stuff, and hit the road. And so they leave. And not on good terms. One day goes by. And I only want the parents to answer this because probably only the parents will get this. One day goes by, parents, and you haven't seen your child. Do you miss them, yes or no? But it's just one day though. Just one day. They've only been gone for one day. Do you miss them, yes or no? Okay. I'm hearing more parents than I saw hands. But that's fine. That's fine. Let's say a week goes by. A whole week, you haven't heard nothing. No phone calls, no text messages, all their Instagram posts and Snapchat, they're all cryptic. You don't know where they are. You don't know what they're doing. A week has gone by. Do you still miss them, yes or no? You guys didn't sound so confident this time. It's only been a week, guys. A week has gone by, no contact. Do you still miss them, yes or no? What about a month? A month now, not a peep. Do you still miss them? What about a year? I don't know about you, but going a day without seeing my wife is, is, is a difficult task. A week, torture. And I can only imagine that having a child would be that little bit worse. Because you're meant to be, you know, completely looking after them. They're under your care. A whole year goes by and not a word. Do you still miss them, yes or no? You still remember their name? You still remember their smell? You walk into their room, you know, and, you, and, and it just hits you. That unhealthy teenager smell. <laughs> Have mercy. Let's, start, let's stop here. 16 years. 16 years and you haven't heard a thing. Parents, be real. Do you still miss them, yes or no? Do you think you miss them more or less? More or less than the one day when they were gone. More, right? Even though they've been gone so long and you haven't heard anything, you miss them more. In fact, every day that goes by, you miss them more, you miss them more, you miss them more. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pities those that fear him. I want you to imagine something, parents. I want you to imagine that after 16 years, you're sitting down in your front room and you hear a knock on the door. And you know, you know when you go to your house, you have your knock. 
Whatever rhythm it may be, you have your knock and that lets the person, whoever's inside, know that it's you. They don't have to ask who is it. They hear it and they're like, oh, yeah, 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 no problem. Now imagine you're sitting down in your front room late at night and you hear that knock. Parents, you hear that knock and you know that knock. And because of that knock, your heart kind of skips a beat because your brain is going 16 years back to the last time you heard it. And, and, and you're kind of apprehensive now. You're, you're anxious. You're curious. Could it actually be? And so you wait and you hear the exact same knock again. And now you know. Now you know. And it's been 16 years. And now you know who's standing on the other side of that door. And so you go to that door. You put your hand on the handle and you start to turn it. And you open it slowly because you're scared of what you might see on the other side. Lo and behold, there's your child. It's been 16 years. And there's your child. But they're not just standing there. They're dripping wet because it's pouring rain outside. They're not just wet, but they're overweight. Like really overweight. Their clothes don't fit them. Their toes are coming out of their shoes. They haven't had a haircut in months. They smell worse than when they were a teenager. And they stand there, face pushed into a frown. They stand there and they don't say anything. And it's been 16 years. Parents, let me ask you a question. What do they have to say for you to let them back inside? Can you say that a bit louder, please? What do they have to say for you to let them back inside? Nothing. Nothing. Now, don't get this wrong. It's been 16 years. You've missed the majority of their life, practically. Because after 35, let's be honest, it goes downhill. I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm playing. I just want to make sure that the adults are listening as well. Sorry, not sorry. 32 years, you've missed their university years. You've missed their venture into the world, starting as a young person, fending for themselves. You may have missed their wedding. You may have missed, you know, the birth of your own grandchildren. 16 years, you missed everything. They stand at the door and they're a mess. And what do they have to say to come back inside? Nothing. Nothing. Not a single word is required for you to let them back inside. You know why? Because like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pities those that fear him. Because even if it's been 16 years, guys, even if it's been 16 years and you haven't spoken to God in 16 years and it's as if he's missed your entire life. You've gone off and lived in the world. You've done your thing. And you haven't even opened your heart to him once in 16 years. When he hears that knock, when he goes to that door, when he opens it and sees you standing on the other side, guess what? Your words are not important. It's not about what you can say in order for him to let you back inside. Because on the other side of that door, the father, the mother, they see their children. And the apology is not what's necessary right now. What's necessary right now is you're a mess and I'm the only one that can help you. And you know that. That's why you've come. That's why you've knocked. This, by the way, is why Jesus wastes zero time talking about the form of prayer. You see that? He says, you want to know how to pray? Okay. Our Father. He doesn't spend time saying, oh, You'd like to know how to pray? Okay, well, first of all, what we do is we kneel down. Sometimes we take off our shoes. And, you know, we clasp our hands like this or like this, depending on your culture. And then, you know, we, we set up the, 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 the little ways that we're going to pray. First of all, we're going to say this, and, and then we're going to say that. And then, you know, we'll move into this, and then we'll finish with this. You know, make sure you do it in your bedroom, down by, you know, the, the end of your bed. Make sure you're facing northeast. About 320 degrees should do it. No time is wasted on form. He goes straight and says, listen, if you truly want to know how to pray. Because, guys, let's be honest. The reason why we don't pray is not because we don't want to do the forms. 
The reason why we don't speak to God is not because, oh, I'm too tired to get on my knees. I don't really want to close my eyes. I might fall asleep. Those aren't the reasons why we don't pray. We don't pray because we forgot who we're praying to. Because we have let go of the facts. We've allowed the world to trick us into thinking that the Father doesn't pity us, that He doesn't desire to be with us, that He's not actually our Father in the first place. It's not the words. It's not the words. Turn with me if you were in your Bibles to First Peter chapter 3. How much time do I have? What's that, 64 minutes I say? First Peter. Chapter 3 and verse 18. Listen to this. For Christ, First Peter 3, 18. For Christ also has suffered how many times for sins? Anyone there? Once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Christ suffered how many times for sins? The just for who? The just for who? Who's the just? Jesus. Who's the unjust? You. The just and me. The just dying for the unjust. So that he may bring us to God. Quick question. When did Jesus die for you? When you were righteous or when you were a sinner? When you were praying all the time or when you hadn't prayed for years? When you had this on point devotional life, do you think that's when Jesus died for you? Or when devotions was the last thing on your mind? When you were just trying to figure out how can I devote myself to the world that little bit more? It's at that time that Jesus is working to bring us to God. To bring us back to life by the Spirit. And you know who it was that sent Christ to die, by the way? Anyone know who it was? John 3, 16. The Father sent His Son. Our Father. We haven't even said a word yet in the prayer. Just our Father. Turn now into 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to look at some scriptures real quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. Some of you will know this. It says, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Let me ask you a question. When Jesus was preaching, who was he preaching for? Himself or the people? Himself or the people? When Jesus is going around doing his miracles, who's those miracles for, himself or the people? So when he's doing all the, the, the teaching, you know, Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 6, whose benefit is that for, himself or the people? But who was the one that was in him doing those things? What does it say? It says to it that God, referring to the Father, was in Christ. Now, don't miss this point. Don't miss this point. It says that the Father was in Christ to reconcile the world back to himself. Watch this. Christianity aside. Every system of worship, every religion that exists has one thing in common. It's down to the sinner or whatever you're called in that sphere to bring yourself back to God. Because you messed up and they're good and they're righteous and they're holy and they're just. But you are not. And because you willingly chose to go astray, it's now on you to come back. But listen to this. According to the Bible, according, according to Jesus, according to God's word, it says that God was working through Christ to reconcile the world back to him. God is the one chasing. Are you with me? Don't, don't confuse yourself into thinking that you're the one chasing God. No, no, no. The natural heart runs in the opposite direction. Right? And what we do is this though. We run in the opposite direction saying, where's Jesus? I just want Jesus. All I want in my life is Jesus. I want to be holy. I want to be good. I want to be righteous. But we know where Jesus is and we're going in the other direction to comfort ourselves sometimes. But yet the Father is working through Christ to bring us back. You know, when I, when I was younger, Lord, the Lord has saved me from this. But when I was younger, I used to have a big mouth. And as you can see, not, not much has changed, trust me, in the last 10 years, like physically. I, I wasn't a muscle man and then became this. And so 
Naturally, growing up in Northwest London, being one of the like three white people in my school full of West Indians and Jamaicans. <laughs> yeah, I said my school, not my church, but could have said the same thing. I kind of, I, I mean, I already stood out, but, but I wanted to be known, you know? And so I, my mouth would just go. Something would happen and I would just make a comment. I would just cuss this guy and cuss that guy. But, but I had an advantage. I had an advantage in that I was very focused on like being good in school, like, you know, getting everything done. And so I would always sit next to the biggest guys. Always sit next to the biggest guys. And I would let them know, listen, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Simple. Let's work together here. Because I know that I can't control what comes out of my mouth. So I'm going to need someone that can control the people that want to do harm to me. But you know, there were some times when it would be those guys that I would rub the wrong way. And who's going to get my back now? And so naturally, you just hide. You just hide. You know, you, you see, picture it this way. If, if there's a guy down there that's looking to just take me out, and I know I have no chance. I have no chance. If I get within like five meters, game over. See you next week when I wake up. If I see him, I'm not walking in that direction. Are you with me? Because I've done wrong to him and he now wants justice. Now, if I see him walking towards me, which direction am I going? This way. In fact, he probably won't even see me. I'll be gone so fast. I'm not going to be the one going to him because I'm scared. Because I'm the one that's done something wrong. Are you with me? God is working in Christ to reconcile. God is the one acting as if he's the one that done something wrong. He's taking it upon himself to go and find the ones that have hurt him. If you hurt me, the onus is on you to come and apologize. But God himself is coming out saying, listen, I'm going to go and seek those that hurt me. Oh, come on. God was in Christ reconciling the world back to himself as if he was the one that done something wrong. Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, All we like sheep have where? Gone astray. Everyone turned to his own way. And the Lord hath... You know what? Let me tell you something. Breaking news. You see this book? Makes no sense. Makes no sense. Some of you like the Bible doesn't make sense. You're right. You just come to that realization the wrong way. It's not that it can't be understood. It's that when it's understood, it makes no sense. Shall I tell you why? Listen to the verse. Listen to the verse. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. It makes no sense. We're the ones that have done wrong, so he's been punished. That's why the world struggles to grasp Christianity. Because they can't understand how someone else can be punished for what they've done. They can't understand why anyone would come and stand in that gap. And what I find so interesting about this passage is it tells me that my sin, don't miss this, is no excuse to not pray. My sin is no excuse to not pray. Because even though I've gone astray, the Father has laid upon him all my iniquities. So I can't say, God, I can't come to you because of this sin. Because the sin has always been covered, it's already been covered for. Me saying to God, listen, I don't know if I can come back because, you know, I've done this and I said I wouldn't do it. It's just an excuse. It's an excuse for us to feel sorry for ourselves. It's an excuse for us to bathe in self-pity. Let me tell you, probably the best piece of advice that I've ever been given. If you fall at 3 p.m., Get up by 301. Can I say that again? If you fall at 3 p.m., then get up by 301. Because there is no excuse to stay down. There is no sin big enough to stay down. Are you with me? There's nothing that you've done that God hasn't seen before, that God hasn't forgiven before. Your case is no more special than anyone else's. We've all gone astray, but yet all of our iniquities have been laid upon him. John is known as the beloved disciple. I want to teach you something about prayer. In chapter 17, Christ prays. You know chapter 17, Christ praying for the world, praying for the church. 
Listen to what it says in John 17, 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but also for them which shall believe on me through their words. So it's not just for the disciples and the apostles that Christ was praying for here. But anyone that believes in Christ. Do you believe in Christ? Yeah. Let me see your hands if you believe in Christ. Then this prayer is for you. Okay, this prayer is for you. Now watch this verse. Now, I'm, I have to do this. If you're, standing next, if you're sitting next to someone, which most of you are, I want you to just hold. I, I, if you know them, only if you know them. Only if you know them. Then, you know, put your arm around them or hold, or hold their hand or something. If you're sitting by yourself, then hold on to the chair. Hold on to the chair. Because I'll be honest, the first time I read this, I was sitting on one of those swivel chairs, and then he broke my neck. John 17, 23. Listen, let's break it down slowly. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me. We're okay so far. We're okay so far. But watch this part now. Watch this part now. This is Jesus speaking, by the way. Jesus says, speaking to his Father, And thou hast loved them as much as thou hast loved me. No, 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 no. I'm not taking one wow. No, 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 no. I in them and thou in me, so that they may know that thou sent me, and that you love them as much as you love me. I don't know about you, but it takes me a little bit of time to develop strong relationships. Close circle takes a lot to get inside. Because I'm the kind of guy that if I'm going to know you, I'm not going to happy Sabbath know you. Are you with me? Like, let's get real. Let's get deep. Let me share with you what Christ has done for me, and you share what Christ has done for you. It takes time to build those kind of relationships. Now, picture if you can. You can't, but if you can. Picture the relationship between the father and the son. Picture how long that relationship has been able to build, been able to brew, been able to foster. Jesus Christ, the son of God and the father have a relationship that has spanned longer than eternity. But yet Jesus can say, knowing the father's love like no one else, that father, I know that you love them, 15, 16, 28, 21 years old. You love them just as much as you love me. Are you with me? Guys, don't miss this. God loves you as an individual, not you as the church. You as an individual as much as he loves Jesus Christ, his son. Now speak to me about your self-worth. God loves you as much as he loves Jesus Christ, his son. Now if we live like that, it won't be too long before we see him. Two more passages as we close. And by the way, you want to share this message with someone? Just go to Luke 15. We're just preaching the prodigal son, really. Son goes away, disappears for a long time, comes back. And guess what? Guess what? This is so deep. Whilst he's away feeding the pigs, the realization comes to him that it's better back home. Right? See, the, de the devil tricks us, tells us like that, there's, that the grass is green on the other side. You ever heard that? If you've never been there, let me give you some inside information. The grass isn't greener on the other side. There's no grass on the other side. <laughs> Just flames. Let's be real. And so he's there in the flames, wishing he was in the grass. And so what he does is this. He says, I'm going to go home. But before I go home, don't miss this, guys. Before I go home, I'm going to plan what I'm going to say when I get there. I'm going to go home and say, Father... I have sinned against you and against heaven, and I am no longer worthy to be called thy son. Make me one of thy hired servants. And so he's got it planned out. He knows when he gets home, he's going to say something specific. And so he gets home, except he doesn't really get to get home yet because the father's already out looking for him. And the father comes to him, and as he's, hey, hey, father, listen, um, by the way, boom. But I, but I had a speech, though. But I had a, I had a prayer that it was so good. In fact, I was going to say, make me lower than what I was. I was going to come down, Father. Yeah. Boom. Woo. Let me give you some new clothes. Yeah. Let me put some jewels on your hand. 
Let me change those dusty shoes. I know you're vegan, but we've got a cough. I don't need to hear your words. I just want you to come inside. Go with me to Luke 18, three chapters ahead if you were in the prodigal son. Luke 18, there's a parable of a woman. And it's called the parable of the unjust judge. I'm just going to summarize it for you. This woman has a problem. She has an adversary, an enemy, someone that's causing her harm. And so she goes to this judge, and we're giving some inside information to this judge, that he does not care about man, and he does not care about God. He's unjust. He's not the guy you want to go to with a complaint, but he's her only option. And so she goes to him and says, listen, this person's troubling me. And you know what the unjust says? I don't care. Get lost. So she goes away, but she's still being troubled. And so she keeps coming back and she keeps coming back and she keeps on coming back. She's just annoying the man. And eventually, eventually he says, okay, listen, I'll sort your problem out. I'll get rid of the adversary and you can live the life you want to live. Jesus is teaching this parable about God, the unjust judge. And I often ask myself, why? But really, this is not a, this is not a parable of comparison. It's a parable of contrast where you and I, we are this woman who has an adversary on our back that just won't leave us alone, won't stop tempting us. But why does he portray God as unjust? Let me tell you, because sometimes that's exactly how we see God. So don't miss this. Jesus is saying this. If God didn't care about you, he would still answer your prayers. If God didn't care about you, if he didn't like man, and if he didn't care about anything else, he would still answer your prayers just because you persevere. But guess what? God's not like that. <laughs> He's not unjust. He's the most just. And if an unjust judge would still answer your prayers, then how much more so a just God? He wants you to pray. He wants you to ask because he wants to answer. And guess what? He wants to do so speedily according to the text. If God hated you, he'd still answer your prayers. But he loves you. Be confident. Be confident. Turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter 5. Last thing as we close. Mark, chapter 5. And we'll go to the first verse. I'm going to teach you something about the Father. Notice, haven't even said a word in the prayer yet. Mark, chapter 5. When you're there, say amen. amen. Let's go from the first verse. Mark chapter 5, verse 1, it says, And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. What do we call that today? What's an unclean spirit? A demon, right? A demon meets him. Who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that he had often been bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been broken by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Not your ideal roommate, right? Well, sometimes we're stuck with them nonetheless. This man is possessed by a demon. He lives in a cave. He can't be bound by chains. He's cutting himself. He's screaming day and night. Quick question. Who's in control? The man or the demon? The man or the demon? The demon, right? Because can a man scream? Man, we know you can scream. Don't be like, no. Can a man scream? Can a man cut himself day and night? Can a man live in a cave? Not without a woman. All these things he can pretty much do by himself. But regardless of how much you pump, you're not breaking out of no chains. So a little bit of information there to tell us that the man's not the one in control in this story. The demon, with his supernatural power, won't allow this man to be bound. Now we've got the picture. Now watch what happens. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Who 
who's in control? The man or the demon? The demon's in control, right? The demon's the one breaking him, breaking the chains and cutting him and forcing him to scream and keep him in the tomb, making him a nuisance to all of society. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Now, if you didn't notice already, demons don't like worshipping Jesus. It's kind of the whole like, you know, if, if, if my enemy's over there, I'm going this way. But, but this man who's being bound and who's cutting himself day and night, screaming and shrieking, sees Jesus afar away, you know, and runs to him. Runs to him. And he gets there, look, verse 7, and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God, the most high? Why are you going to run to someone that you know is going to take you out and then ask them, what do you want with me? You should have been gone a long time. Look what it says. I adjure thee, I beg thee, by God. <laughs> the demon's praying. I beg thee by God that thou do not torment me. Brothers conflicted. For he said unto him, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, saying, what is thy name? And he answered, saying, my name, my name is what? Legion, for we are many. Legion is just another way of saying about 3,000 to 6,000 soldiers. This was not a fancy name that one demon got. This was just what we called a pack of demons that big. Yeah. Watch this, guys. The man is possessed by 6,000 demons. Yeah. The man is, you know, you know what it looks like when one person is possessed by one demon? Yeah. Everyone runs away. This man's possessed by 6,000 demons. 6,000 devils have control over this guy's life. But when he just sees Jesus afar off, he's able to run. He's able to get there. And we know that in that running, it was not the demon that done it. Because when the demon gets there, guys, guys, listen to this. Who is the one person the man wants to see? Who is the one person the demon doesn't want to see? But the demon's in control. The demon's in control apparently. But some way, somehow, when the man sees Jesus, no longer now is it the 6,000 demons that are in control. The man sees the one person that can save his soul. The one person that he's desperately longing more than anyone else to see. The one person he knows can save him from the demons. Now watch this, because we're not even there yet. We haven't even hit the point. He gets there. He falls at the feet of the one person he needs, but the words that comes out of his mouth are not what he wants to say. Because it's not about the words. Because after so long of being away, after so long of being tormented by demons, he finally sees the one he needs. And when he gets there, he just doesn't know what to say. Have you been there? Have you been there? When you know you need to go back. And you fall on your knees or you lie on the floor or you jump up and down. I don't know how you pray. But you just don't know what to say. You, still, you don't know what to say. How can I ask forgiveness for the same thing over and over? Do I say the same thing I said last time? Because last time I was forgiven, so do I just say it again? You ever get there and you just don't know what to say? Let me give you some encouragement. The man gets there with 6,000 demons on his back. Mm -hmm. The words that comes out of his mouth are not what he wants to say. Mm -hmm. But guess what? Jesus still answers his prayer. Yeah. Now, you guys aren't with me. No, 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 no. He gets there on his knees, and he doesn't even get to say the prayer. Yeah. And Jesus answers the prayer. Yeah. Come on. I don't know how many times I've been there, guys. When I've fallen on my knees and I know what I need, I know what I desire, I know how much I need the Lord, but the words just can't come. Yeah. Still answers. Yeah. Still answers. Yeah. Still so faithful. Yeah. I don't serve an unjust judge. Yeah. Yeah. I don't serve an unjust judge. Let me leave you with this. Let me leave you with this. Every sincere prayer is heard in heaven. Now watch this. It may not be fluently expressed. Someone say amen. amen. But if the heart is in it, 
it will ascend to the sanctuary where Jesus ministers and he will present it to the father watch this without one awkward stammering word but beautiful and fragrant with the incense of his own perfection she goes on prayer is heaven's ordained means in success with the conflict with sin and the development of the Christian character the divine influences that come in answer to the prayer of faith will accomplish in the soul of the suppliant all for which he pleads listen there's a list for the pardon of sin do you want to be pardoned from your sin for the Holy Spirit put your hand up if this is you for a Christ-like temper come on for wisdom for strength to do his work for any gift he has promised we may ask and the promise is ye shall receive Paul says to the church in Romans that the spirit of God intercedes on behalf of man and prays prayers that the heart can't even utter. You know, sometimes you've been praying prayers and the prayers that you've prayed are not the ones that made it to heaven. Let me give you an example. Lord, I'm 27. I still don't have no one. I need a spouse, Lord. I want to have a family. And so the Holy Spirit hears that prayer. And he goes up to heaven. And he says, Father, Dean has a request. He's asking that you help him to be content with his singleness. Because we know not what we ought to pray for. The prayers that we pray are not always the prayers that make it to heaven. Because sometimes we're praying, Lord, why are they doing well when I'm not? And so the spirit goes to heaven and says, listen, Dean wants you to bless that person even more. In spite of him. We pray to the Lord and we say, Lord, listen, you know, I need that A. I need that first because mom and dad are at home waiting for that phone call with the first. And so the spirit goes up and the spirit says to the father, listen, we need to speak to that teacher. Because even though he got that right, we need to make it wrong. So he can go home with that second and be humbled. And sit down with the rest of us and strive to be something. Sometimes the prayers that you pray are not the ones that make it to the kingdom. But you best believe that it's the prayers that God needed to hear. It's the prayers that God knows you need answered. Guys, guys, let's be real. Let's be real. It's been too long. Too long since we opened our heart fully and completely to him. Too long he's been sitting on that chair just waiting to hear that knock. Your knock. Let's make today that day when he hears it. I don't know how long it's been for you. I don't know if maybe you didn't pray this morning. Maybe you forgot. Maybe it slipped your mind because you were so excited to be here. Maybe you haven't prayed in a week. Maybe it's been a month. Maybe it's been a year. Maybe it's been years because you're going through a struggle that no one in this building even understands. But let me tell you that it's not about the words, guys. It's not about the words. The words will come. The words will come. What's important is that you take the opportunity while you still have it to come back to the door and knock. So I'm going to ask if there is anyone here today that needs to come back and that needs to knock on the door. Maybe it's been a week, maybe it's been a month, maybe it's been a year, I don't care. But you know. You want to come back today. You want to open your heart to God as a friend. You want to fall on your knees and say, Lord, it's been so long, but I just want to come home. You know it's my desire to come home. I'm just going to ask if that's you that you stand to your feet. And please don't stand because no one else stands. Don't stand. Let this be a real one.
And before I close in prayer, it would be wrong of me to not do this. Maybe it's not about coming home for you because maybe it's not home yet. But you want it to be home. You've been living in the world for long enough and you see that through everything it's been God working through Christ, bringing you back, bringing you here, bringing you home to the home you never knew. If today you want to make a commitment to get to know God, maybe for the first time in your life, I'm just going to ask that you raise your hand. If that's you. Because even though you've never been to that home, he still knows your knock. If that's you, just raise your hand. You want to make that commitment today. You want to say, Lord Jesus, I want to come home today. Praise the Lord. Anyone else before we close? Just make that decision today. We'll sort out everything else afterwards. But make the decision in your heart today. If that's you, just raise your hand. Father in heaven. Lord, we recognize your spirit speaking to our hearts today. And Father, for some of us it's been so long. It's been so long since we really spoke to you, since we really told you what we're going through. Not for you, but for us. Father, I pray that your spirit will move upon these young people. That you move upon the elders here, that you move upon me, Lord. And convict us, Lord. Convict us strongly that there truly is no place like home. And that through prayer, we have been given such a privilege in being able to directly communicate with you, Lord. I'm going to make a commitment today, Lord, that I can only keep by your grace. That not a day will go by when I don't speak to you. We want to make that commitment today, Lord. Because we can't tell others about you if we're not telling you about us. Bless us and bring us into an even closer relationship with you. For some of us, bring us into that relationship with you. Our Father, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.